prvi keynote predavač će pričati o prenapuhanim tehnologijama i kamo budućnost ide. On je inače svećenik, odnosno jezuit, koji se razumije u tehnologiju. Molim vas, jedan aplauz, njegova tema se zove The End of Everything as we know it. Padre Robert Baleser! Dobro jutro! That's it. That's all I got. That's the only Croatian you'll ever hear out of me. It's an incredibly difficult language, and those of us who speak English, that's pretty much all we can hope for. Now, before we start, and before we blow out all your eardrums, I think I owe you two apologies. The first apology is to all of you, to Croatia, to this beautiful city. I've been all over the world. I've done presentations everywhere. I've never been to Zagreb. I've spent two days here, and this is an incredible city your architecture, your history, your food, the warm people, so I'm sorry I've never been here before. Especially seeing this, this community, what bug has formed, this is so strong. This, this is how the tech movement used to be in the United States 30 years ago, and I'm so happy, <laughs> so happy to see it here now. The second apology I have to give you is for the incredible clickbait title of the end of everything as we know it. I know this is the worst tradition of the internet, but please let me explain. It sounds like I'm about to throw a wet blanket over the, the party, over the passion that is the tech community here in Zagreb, but that's not true. I believe in big sky engineering. I believe in dreaming big. I believe that us here, if you are here, it means that you're a, you're a geek, you're a nerd, you're a researcher, you're an engineer, you're a scientist, you're a futurist, you are a maker. And as a futurist, as a nerd, as a geek, as a maker, you are expected, you are required to dream big. You're required to imagine things being greater. You are required to always look for a technological solution that might be just around the corner. We love tech. We revel in tech successes. We look for tech advancements. We learn from tech failures, and that is all incredibly, incredibly good. But that being said, I don't think anyone can doubt that there's a problem in our field right now, a problem in most fields, and that is that we tend to conflate the future with futurism. We look for our trends in what we hope will happen rather than what is actually happening and, and what should happen. And so that's what I want to do in this talk. That's what the title of the talk actually means. For the next 25 minutes, I want to talk about those trends that you can actually use. Not something that might be happening in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I want to look at the trends that are happening right now that you can leave this show and get involved with. Developments that you can actually use. Technology that's actually being developed. In other words, for the next 25 or so, 21 minutes, I want to get real. Now, if you've been to any of these types of talks, you know that AI is all the rage right now. It is the number one must-have technology for every technology manufacturer out there. If you don't have AI, it means that you're not competitive. And if you've listened to these talks and you've seen the market research, you understand that one of the biggest indicators is that market research companies are falling over themselves to come up with a prediction for how much this market will be worth. And actually, it's fascinating reading. I took a random sampling of the market reports that ended up in my inbox, just four of them. And according to them, the AI market is currently worth between one and $400 billion USD annually. And by 2025, it's going to be worth somewhere between 90 billion and three trillion. Now, that's a joke. Of course, that can't happen. It's clear that AI is going to be a key technology. It's going to drive the trends. It's going to drive the market. But the reason why you're seeing such a disparity is because the market and us, well, we really don't know what AI is yet. We haven't defined it. 
We've done a really, really bad, bad job at telling people what they can expect, what AI can actually accomplish, what it's actually good at. And unfortunately, that hinders us, that pulls us back. Because when we have an unrealistic expectation of what AI can do, it means that marketing is blocking innovation. Now, there is no place that's better to see this overselling of AI than CES. Go ahead and run the first video. We've got AI in your phone, AI in your appliances, AI in your car, AI in your drone. AI is the new table stakes for high-tech leaders. And CES had a cornucopia of boots that demonstrated their AI applications. GE had a demo of machines that could actually monitor their own efficiency and tell you when they're about to break before problems actually happen. There was another demonstration at Samsung of a new service that they're rolling out called Prismit, which is actually an AI that will look for stories that it thinks you will like. Then it will look for stories around that story. It will look for the history of that story. It will look for all the issues involved in that story and create a customized, contextualized profile just for you. Now, all of these advancements have been fueled by that buzz, that buzz I talked about, the buzz behind AI. And that's a good thing. Intel, GE, Amazon, Microsoft, NVIDIA, IBM, Google, Apple, Facebook, they're all investing billions and billions of dollars into AI development, and their research is pushing forward the field. But there's a downside to that buzz. Because of the rush to do this, because of the rush to market, they're selling the promise of AI, even though they don't really know what it is. We're failing to make the distinction between automation, dumb AI, and smart AI. And then we're using AI in places that just don't make sense. And ultimately, that leads to products that are AI in name only. Go ahead and run video two. Example, many applications, perhaps most applications, don't actually need AI. It's fun to say that they have AI. It's, it's good in marketing to, to say that th this is an AI product, but I don't need AI to play ping pong. I don't need AI to run a factory. I don't need AI in my toilet. I don't need AI to run my doorbell or to, to, to run my speaker system. Those are problems that can be solved by automation. Simple response to stimuli. I don't need a deep learning computer for this, but because I have conflated all of these different types of automation, automation, dumb AI, and AI, it means that we have muddled the waters and we have stopped researching what we should be researching. I think the easiest way to understand the differences between this is to separate automation as those things that can be solved with a direct response to stimulus where dumb AI versus smart AI is the difference between recognizing patterns and recognizing narratives. Let me explain what that means. Run the next video. Two years ago, CSAIL, it's a uh, college at MIT, they created a project. They had a learning machine, and they fed the learning machine two million videos from YouTube. And they wanted to see if this learning machine could figure out how the videos would end. Now, if you're like me, and you're human, and I think most of us here are human, you have an innate ability to intuit. Watch enough anime, or sci-fi, or drama, or whatever genre it is that you prefer, and you start to know how stories start and end. If someone gave you the plot line for a movie, but left out the beginning and the end, you could probably fill in the blank. And MIT thought maybe with a learning machine, they might be able to do the same thing. But what they found out was that while the experiment was fantastic and it led to a lot of advances in the field, AI is just not that smart. In fact, Professor Michio Kaku called it a lobotomized cockroach. The AI that they created could take patterns and data, but it could not take patterns in a narrative. Here's, here's the difference. In, in that video, you saw that they had a clip of a train leaving the station. Well, a smart AI would know that eventually that train is going to leave and then you'd have an empty station. That's what we would say. 
But the dumb AI, MIT's AI, their learning machine, what it did was it recognized the train, it recognized the station, it recognized the people, and then it just kept adding cars to the train because it didn't know, it couldn't intuit that eventually the train had to leave. That's a clear example of dumb AI versus smart AI. And right now what we have is dumb AI. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Go ahead and run the next video. You see, dumb AI, when properly implemented, is able to process suitable tasks in a fantastic way. It does data pattern recognition, maybe not the whole story, but individual pieces. Now, this is the AI that is revolutionizing facial recognition. This is the AI that you find in advanced drones. This is the AI that you will see in the next version of your voice assistant. And I say next version because most of us are using voice assistants that aren't even dumb AI yet. They're really just automation. So as we move to this, as we start understanding that we live in a generation of dumb AI, and we will be dealing with dumb AI for at least the next half decade to a decade, it allows us to push our development forth, to actually invest our time, our resources, and yes, our money in dumb AI applications that will work right now. And so, that means that we've got the end of AI and everything and the rise of the dumb AI. Now, let's go ahead and start talking a little bit about the second trend, because if the first trend is the rise of dumb AI, the end of AI and everything. The second trend has to be something that can actually use that AI. And we have it in the end of social media. Okay, this is another clickbait title. I'm sorry, yes, I know, I know. I'm, I'm just sort of trying to drag you out. I'm trying to create a fight, but hear me out. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence that says that social media cannot continue as it currently is going. Facebook has almost weekly problems with privacy. They're always getting in trouble. Twitter has a problem with bots and a president. Instagram has a lot of fake followers. YouTube, for some reason, is algorithmically serving up conspiracy videos to young children. Now, all of this, all of this is anecdotal information that tells us that something has to change. We are approaching the end of social media, but it's easy to say the end is going to come from government crackdown, or it's going to come from uh, the users revolting. But it actually comes from something much simpler. Advertisers. Now, let's be clear. Advertising money in social media is growing at an exponential rate. Last year, we spent $40 billion more on online advertising than we did on TV. CBS estimates by the end of this year will be at parity. There will be as much money spent online, online advertising, as there is in the real world. But you can see trouble brewing in this market because those third-party social media managers are starting to indemnify themselves against false metrics. They understand that the worst thing that can happen to your advertising dollar is that your advertisers realize they're not getting what they're paying for. And this is what scares social media. Let's take a trip back. Let's go back to 2017. In 2017, Facebook just had to admit that they had been solving, serving up fake ads, and they had to refund many of their advertisers because they were charged for something that didn't actually get them any return on investment. The United States Department of Justice had released a series of indictments against just one operation that had managed to bilk $36 million from digital advertisers. The New York Times had run a study that showed that less than 60%, imagine that, less than 60% of the traffic on the internet is actually generated by humans. The rest is bots. Since then, all the major social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, have purged hundreds of millions of accounts, of users, of pictures, of posts, of content that they've realized is coming from influence, influence peddlers and from bots. But they're fighting a losing battle. And in the past year, there have been at least a dozen damning exposés about the dark side of social media. The New York Times, they ran more than a dozen stories last year, and they detailed followers for hire operations. They ran a story showing that 
almost one in 10, that's 95 million Instagram accounts were actually fake and were being used to sell followers, to sell heat, to sell passion. We also saw Twitter purge tens of millions of their accounts because they were being run by bots or by foreign entities. Now, Facebook's quarterly report suggests that 13% of their profiles, that's almost 270 million, are fake. A survey of Twit users indicated that between 8.8 and 14.6% of their users, that's between 29 and 48 million profiles, are fake. Now, the profits are still growing, but there's clearly panic in the room. Because if you remember, these are the organizations that lived and died by their user count. The fact that they're willing to slice it means that they've recognized that they've lost control of their platforms. So how do they get it back? Well, we've already talked about how the current AI, dumb AI, is very good at micro-pattern recognition. Maybe not the whole narrative, but definitely good at looking at small patterns, uh, small patterns of data. And folks, bots are nothing, if nothing, but small patterns of data. Now, they can use dumb AI to look for when they see bot-like activity. They can look for deviations and determine what is real traffic and what is not real traffic. And this is why Google, Facebook, and Twitter have recently built up their AI offices. They, not, they know that not only can dumb AI help them solve their problems, but it can give them a competitive advantage. If they can prove to their advertisers that they are giving them what they paid for, well, that's where the advertisers are going to go. So the end result of this is the end of social media and the rise of the AI curated media. It's the proper implementation of a dumb AI. Imagine in your feed a dumb AI working tirelessly day and night, automatically removing all of those stories, all of the posts, all of the images that are designed to manipulate you. In other words, the rise of the AI curated media means going back to the first days of social media, where it was one person, one voice, how good of an idea do you have? Now, there was another major trend at CES, and that was the connected future. You couldn't walk through the halls of CES without running into vendor after vendor who were displaying their IoT devices. How many people here have an IoT device in their house? Okay, you're all lying. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. Now, connectivity and technology is what they promised at CES, and they tried to deliver. And, and yes, the pitch is very alluring. The idea of having access to everything at any given time for any reason, of being able to gather all of that data and run it through a big data engine is something I would very much like to do. To have massively redundant networks that can enable intelligence within everything from your car to your house. What's not to like about that? That's an amazing future at least it would be, if that connected future wasn't so easy to own. Two months ago, Nokia released their threat intelligence report, and the news was alarming. Nokia looked at malware detection events across all of the carrier networks that they examined, and they found that in 2018, botnet activity accounted for 78% of all attacks. Wind back two years to 2016, and it was single digits. And then Mirai was released, and that jumped to 33%, and then 50%, and then 60%, and now 78%. And by the end of this year, it's probably going to be above 90%. Botnets are now the number one attack to watch for. They are the number one attack that might affect you, and unfortunately, they're the number one attack that's going to be helped by this idea of the connected future. In just two years, botnets went from a statistical anomaly to the biggest threat to the internet and to what we love. Now, this all happened with the commoditization of network devices. It's now easier than ever to have a device, a phone, a speaker, or whatever that's internet connected. And unfortunately, the number that they're banding about right now is that by 2025, there will be 100 billion it's not a typo. 100 billion with a B, Internet of Things devices connected to the Internet. Go ahead and run the next video. 
I spent much of the second day of CES in this automotive, automotive pavilion where they showed me what they thought was the future of smart vehicles and everything was on display from self-driving cars to fully integrated entertainment systems to offices on wheels. And yes, it was sparkly and wonderful to look at, but there was a question that I asked of all the vendors that I visited. With all this technology, I asked them, what have you done to make sure that the car is separated from all that traffic, all those other connected devices. And not one, not one vendor could give me a good answer. Some vendors would refer to an engineer and the engineer would say something like, well, this is a prototype and we'll probably get that figured out by the time we release. There were other vendors who said, that's an important thing we really don't know. There was one vendor who actually tried to convince me that 5G was gonna solve all the security problems. I think he was just really tired or drunk. But the problem is we haven't thought about that. We haven't thought about what it might mean. We haven't thought about what it is to connect all of our vehicles, all of our most important devices to this internet of things, to this 100 billion devices. And we know exactly what's gonna happen. Not too long ago, Miller and Valasek actually showed us that they could take over a car through the internet connected entertainment system. And honestly, the industry has not really progressed much fast past that. Now, I want a connected future, but unfortunately, I have to pay attention to those threats. And those threats mean the third trend, which is the end of the connected future and the rise, the return of the walled garden. And yes, I know, I hope I'm really, really wrong on this, but I don't think I am. How many people here ever used AOL? Oh, man, I'm old. If you used AOL, you know what the walled garden is. It's this idea of separating yourself from the different parts of the network. Well, that's where we're heading. All these manufacturers looking at these 100 billion devices, Microsoft and Amazon and Google are starting to realize they need to leverage their cloud-based computing to create walled gardens where they can protect the devices, where they can make sure that they're not infecting everything else, where they can make sure that botnets don't spread. And yes, this trend, it goes a little bit against what I like with open platforms and such, but I unfortunately think it's going to be a necessity. Now, we have just enough time to talk about one more trend, and uh, I actually kind of like this. You see, one of the other things that you saw a lot at, at CES was health technology. Now, let me ask a quick question here. Who here in the audience is wearing some piece of health technology. See, and now I know you don't understand. Now, some of you are lying. How many people here have a phone? Right? If you have a phone, if you've bought a phone in the last three years, if you've equipped that phone with accessories, you have health technology. You may not use it, but you have it. And this market is huge. $50 billion by some accounts just this year alone. But we're starting to see a shift, a change. We've seen everything from technologies like this, which I'm wearing right now, by the way. This is a device that uses an ultrasound transducer on my abdomen to tell me how full my bladder is. It's time to go. <laughs> the things like this. This is technology, wearable technology that helps people to conceive babies. All of this technology is part of what I'm calling the second wave of health tech. And I'll go ahead and run the next video. Wearable tech is quite mature, we know that. It's been around for a while, from the, the first Fitbit in 2007, and even devices before that. But what we've seen recently is this shift. There's a shift from just having tech that gives you interesting information, like how much I've walked, or the device in my ear that actually tells me what my, my blood oxygen is going to be. Or yes, the device on my abdomen that tells me whether or not I need to use the restroom. We've gone into this second wave of the technology, second wave of wearable health tech. You see, if the first wave was about giving us information and then letting us find a problem that that information might solve, the second wave is about finding a problem something that actually affects people and the determining what is the best way to get information to solve that problem. Now, I've got just a couple of seconds here, but I do want to show you a little bit about this, this second wave technology that I'm actually currently using. The, the D-Free, 
I, I know, this is gonna cause giggles, this is gonna cause laughs, but this was originally designed for use in care homes where people would have patients who would have trouble knowing if it's time to go. What I love about this is the first time they pitched this device to me, I laughed, but then I realized this is so much more useful than wave one. When I can have a piece of technology that is not only interesting, not only technologically fascinating, but can actually improve the quality of life and the basic human dignity of the people using it, that's health tech that I think is worth the world. I, I think that's it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully by now you understand you understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the end of everything. What I'm talking about is the end of these hype cycles. What I'm talking about are these four trends that I've just brought up. The idea of dumb AI, the idea of curated social media, the idea of a walled connected future, and the idea of the second wave of health tech. These are trends that you can use right now. When you leave this room, when you leave this show, these are technologies that need to be developed right now. Not in five years, not in 10 years, not some point in the future. Hopefully when you leave this talk and when you leave this show, you'll know that the end of all things, of everything as we know it, is actually a good thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, please uh, join me on stage. Imamo vremena za dva pitanja. Ja ne bi trošio da ga ja pitam nešto. Ima neko pitanje. Mislim, čovjek je pričao toliko o tehnologiji. First, I have a question. What is a Mirai? Mirai is, yeah, the botnet. So Mirai in 2016, that was the virus that was released into the wild that took over cameras and routers and baby monitors and turned them into huge botnets that could be used to take down parts of the internet. Why would somebody do that? Because we get bored. Oh. No, but, uh, but honestly, it's also because we've now realized we can weaponize that. The Mirai virus and those botnets were actually used for denial of service for higher services. If I have a, an opponent, if I have a company I want to take down, I could use those hundreds of millions of devices to send enough traffic to make sure that no one ever can, can reach those services. How? Uh, I would send a simple command. I, I, have, I have a couple of enemies. <laughs> okay, uh, imamo još jedno pitanje. Možete bilo što pitat, mislim, svečani koji se bavi tehnologijom. Bilo što, anybody? Evo, we, we have a question there. What do you think about blockchain technology? Ah, see, I didn't bring blo I, blockchain was in my original draft, and I knew I wasn't going to have time for it because it is such a, an incredible, expansive topic. I will say this. I think it's good right now that there's difficulties in the cryptocurrency market. I don't wish ill on cryptocurrency, but I think people conflate blockchain with Bitcoin or blockchain with cryptocurrency. Blockchain is so much more useful than just cryptocurrency. We're actually starting to see real world blockchain examples that have nothing to do with digital currency. And I think when we start to see that, when we, when we see things like ownership logs and distributed ledgers for microtransactions, that's when blockchain actually becomes something that's not just a buzzword. Okay, can you uh, uh, now bless, please, my portfolio? <laughs> and everybody's here because we really need it. It was a harsh year. We're poor. Well, I, uh, I, I blessed... <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Padre. Thank you so much.